Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, gardening guy Paul James joins host Casey Hinches to shine some light on some great shade plants. We stop by the Tulsa Botanic Garden, we visit a yard that has gone wild with native prairie, and Barbara Brown prepares a salad with raspberries. Here at Southwood Landscape and Garden Center with our favorite Paul James. <laughs> you Paul. say that about I, everybody. Oh no, no. <laughs> Paul, we want to talk about shade plants today. And Good. we're sitting here in your shade house at Southwood, which is a nice place to be when it starts getting hot. <laughs> yes, we just need a couple of cool beverages. <laughs> we do. <laughs> so let's talk about being in a shade garden. What are some of the pros and cons of uh, shade gardening and Maybe we can take a look at a few plants too. It's one of my favorite kinds of gardening. Shade gardens are so soothing and calming, and you're you're not usually going to see like really bright colors that you would see in a full sun setting. Mm -hmm. And I like that. Now the downside is it can get a little dark, but there are ways to liven up a shade garden. Right. Um, so I've just always loved shade gardening, and fortunately lived in places that had plenty of shade. So I learned <laughs> to adapt. Easily one of the most popular is sitting right next to you. Right. That's, that's not me, by the way. <laughs> that's the hydrangea. Um, holy cow. I mean, they just, they're such beautiful plants. Relatively easy to grow. You know, they can be a little finicky in mm -hmm. terms of soil type and drainage issues and stuff. But by and large, it's a, it's a fairly easy plant to grow. And, the, and there's so many options with oh, hydrangeas now. So they're many. doing so many things with their cultivars. And of course, there's different species and stuff. Right. But, right. Um, and next to it, what used to be in the same genus is botanist broke it out into its own genus a few it's, decades ago. It's hard ago. to keep up with them these days. Well, and, and the downside, this is the viburnum, this mm -hmm. is summer snowflake. And the downside to it is when they no longer call it a hydrangea, people instantly were unfamiliar with it. Right. And that's too bad because viburnum, to me, is one of the greatest shrubs that you can grow. It, it is definitely a great genus and one you want to include somehow in your Love garden. Them. And very tolerant of shade and will still flower very prolifically even with shade. You know, most plants in shade, your you're couple hours of morning sun followed by shade the rest of the day is perfect. Or dappled light or mm -hmm. dappled shade, however mm -hmm. you want to describe it, throughout the day right. is another great setting for all of these plants. Right. And I would say, you know, even if they get some full morning sun, as long as that intense heat in the afternoon, right. if they're shaded during that, usually they'll do pretty well. Right. But plants for shade yeah. will not grow in full sun. Right. Not, not, Hands down. Uh, yeah. They're gone. <laughs> that afternoon heat will take them out quickly. So what do we got over here? We you got know, some astilbe, it looks like. We didn't like. even have to get up and move, do we? <laughs> yeah, we uh, this is a stilby, uh, beautiful flowering plant for mm -hmm. shade. Because you know, a lot of pe times people will say, yeah, I'll shade plants, but there are no flowers. That's not entirely true. This, uh, I just, I, I've always loved these. They come in a mix of colors. Mix of colors. I started out with an old variety called Deutschland, which is white. But yeah, mm -hmm. now you can get them in purples and pinks and all kinds of different colors. Really easy to grow, long-lasting perennial. It'll stay in the garden for years. And what I liked about them is they're, they have some really um, neat foliage, but also the the flower is really kind of an airy flower. It's light and fluffy. It is. Sort, it is. So. It's kind of a see-through flower, yeah, too. Yeah, you know? exactly. Exactly. All right. Now I think we need to walk a little bit. All right. Let's go find some more. Because I'm sure we both need a little exercise. <laughs> let's go this way over here first. Okay. So, Paul, speaking of adding color to your shade garden, nothing better than coral bells to do that. Absolutely. The heucheras, they're just so wonderful. I've always been partial to the chartreuse colors, but it was the darker, I think plum pudding was the original uh -huh. introduction. It was so popular. 
but look at the contrast you get right. from the two. Yeah, I mean, you should get both of them while you you're really here, should. right? <laughs> now, in a shade garden, if, it, if there's not a lot of light, then that's not going to be as pronounced as that. Mm -hmm. But still, I mean, either way you go, you're in good shape. Now, there are heucheras. Heucherellas, tiarellas, there's exactly. all of this, yeah. Uh, what's the difference? You know, it takes a botanist to really right. ascertain the difference. So I don't worry about that. It's just, it's just, do you like it or not? Right, right. There's um, a little difference in the flowers, you know, but I mean, right, th right. they all have really nice flowers and foliage to them. And I love the variegation here. And then, you know, you get all the way. This is an this, interesting coppery kind of color. Yeah, I love the name. I mean, it's such a Southern name. Sweet, Sweet tea. tea. <laughs> <laughs> so a perfect plant for a Southern garden. Yeah. And then uh, here, you know, you've got, if, if you see, this is a, uh, Carnival black olive, so you've got some green, but then you've got the dark purple as well. So that's interesting. And also, those sh uh, those colors might change a little bit again, depending on sure. how much shade or a little bit of part sun that they get. You're exactly right. So let's let's go find some more. Well, we've got a forest of hostas back here. <laughs> again, a beautiful foliage to add to a shade garden. They're just such awesome plants. Yeah and they thrive here, they're easy to grow, you can dig and divide them in early spring. Mm -hmm. Probably the, the real challenge to hosta would be the slug. Yes. Um, but there are the iron sulfate products, okay. um, Sluggo is, is a name brand. Uh, they're excellent, excellent control. So uh, yeah, or you know, you can come up with your favorite escargot recipe. <laughs> well, what I love about the hostas is- A little is butter, a little garlic, <laughs> you know, parsley. Oh, sorry. What I love about the hostas though is the size of the leaves. I yes. mean, you can get really small hostas. Yes. Or you can get some huge hostas that have these giant, oh, we lost. Sorry, I, I just left camera. <laughs> so speaking of small ones. Yes. I mean, look at, it's, yeah, it's Golden tiny. It's, prayers. it's not any bigger than our hand. The leaves are going to stay pretty small. Um, and Ginkgo Craig is another one that's one of the little miniature. But then you can find some that have leaves that are bigger that than. They're huge. Yeah. And and different leaf textures too. Mm -hmm. You know. They have some rippling to yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And those are cool. And I, I love the kind of the bluish ones. You I know? do too. Like Crosa Regal, yeah. I think, is yeah. one of the blue ones. Uh, yeah. You can't go wrong with Hasta in the right, shade. Right, right. It's, it's, in fact, I'd call it the number one shade plant. Okay. Hands down. All right, well, let's go like, look at a couple more. Let me put this down. And, let's look at ferns. Okay, Casey, I love ferns. You can't have a shade garden without a fern. I love almost everything, but <laughs> no, I'm, I've been a huge fan of ferns for a long time. Uh, this is the ostrich fern, which is one of the most airy and open. Mm -hmm. It's one of um, our bigger ones. It is, it's pretty good size and will slowly spread, mm -hmm. not the least bit invasive, but it will move a little bit. Um, and it's or just- shareable. <laughs> Or shareable. Or shareable, <laughs> exactly. Um, the Lady in Red has been a, a really popular fern with this beautiful red stem. Yeah, I love that. I haven't seen that before. And then of course the Autumn Fern will always be my favorite simply because it's evergreen. And it really is dependably evergreen. It also, that new foliage is this gorgeous bronze. Mm -hmm. It's hard to beat. Yeah, I, I think, though, I have to say mine like is the Japanese painted fern. Um, well, just they're gorgeous because of as well. the color that it has on its leaves. No question. No question. They are stunning. Uh, but come on, look at that bronze foliage. Yeah, right that's a nice contrast. Now, it's funny. Let's see, if, let's see if I can find an example without destroying plants. Oh, here we go. So look, we have people come in all the time and say, Oh my goodness, there are these terrible bugs <laughs> all over my ferns. What do I do? Yeah. So these are the spores. These, right. these reproduce asexually. So these are the spores from which you get more ferns. Right. Flowers don't have traditional, or excuse me, ferns don't have traditional flowers. Right. They have spores. So. Right. So this is not a pest. You don't need to spray. <laughs> you just need to continue to enjoy. Yeah. That's it, great. I mean, I can see where people get startled looking at yeah, that. Yeah, it looks like that. But it's actually a nice pattern underneath there. It is. There. It is. Very distinctive. All right. Let's go find a couple more. Oh, there's always more. Let's go this way. Okay. Here's another one of my favorites. It's a grass. An ornamental grass for shade. Yes. That's unusual. Yeah. yeah. This is Japanese forest grass, Hakanakloa or mm -hmm. Hakoni grass. Japanese forest grass is the best <laughs> name. Uh, love this stuff. It's hard to grow. so. It, you know, you, you're not going to find it typically in a really big form at the nursery. Right. But once it's in the ground, 
it'll grow two by two, a little bit more than that even, and it droops. And I've seen it even used as the spiller in containers, oh, absolutely. in a shade container. It's a so. great spiller. Yeah, it's now, a nice uh, vegetation. Real quick, Solomon seal. This has always been... The variegated one we typically know. Right, yeah. very familiar. This is a new one though. Okay. Called uh, Szechuan, what's it called? Szechuan jade. Wow. And holy cow, look at the glossy this, leaf on that. It, it looks like you've shined it. I know. Just for our show. I know. <laughs> it's just gorgeous. And the stems are really, oh, really interesting too. Mm -hmm. You can see it's got flowers that are on there. So uh -huh. we've just touched the surface. There are so many more shade plants out there. Right. But I think this is a good selection to get folks started and to realize shade should not be a limitation. And you can do ground covers, you can do plants, perennials, <laughs> annuals, and shrubs, all in Pacisandra, the shade. Pacisandra, ajuga, hellebores, oh my goodness, again, there's so many more choices. Yeah, so if you have a shady backyard, don't feel limited, take advantage of all those opportunities. There's a lot of shady characters out there. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I'm one of them. <laughs>the Tulsa Botanic Garden and joining me is Lori Hudson and Lori you guys have got so much going on this summer we wanted to let our viewers know a little bit about it you're in the process of transitioning it looks like yeah we're definitely in the process of transitioning Tulsa Botanic blooms you know thousands of, of uh, tulips and other bulbs are out now and we're in the middle of putting out our summer annuals so we're really encouraging everybody to come back out it's different it's gonna be a lot of color a lot of foliage um, this this summer and um, you know we're excited about it. We're so using bromeliads. You're doing nice. a tropical theme. Really. A big tropical theme. And of course, a lot of summer annuals are tropicals, but they're. I mean, we just have this incredible staff, and they've got you know we've got over 300 bromeliads, all these different varieties. We've got a lot of brilliant like things that are some people would recognize as a house plant. You know, mm -hmm. like crotons and things like that that have just beautiful, bright, vibrant foliage that you know you don't have to worry about if it's blooming or not it's just going to be sitting there and just giving us a lot of color and of course the rest of the garden will be coming alive it's already coming alive but that that'll be happening too so. yeah i mean just look behind us you can see yeah. a lot of the perennials are coming back out and exactly. everything and so and the children's garden is alive right now i mean it's it's so yeah. active i mean you have a lot going on here and, and it's all throughout the summertime. Yeah, yeah, so we, you know, we're doing some new things. Um, we, we're bringing back our story time. So, you know, throughout the summer on Friday mornings, we're gonna have story times for kids, you know, that are all nature, different themes each, each week. We're doing some wellness mornings um, for kids and mm -hmm. families, which is kind of fun. Get them out in the garden early in the morning and doing some yoga and stuff like that. And then we're just doing all kinds of, you know, we have our Thursday nights that we've been doing for a little while. And so we're doing music nights. We're continuing with that. In July, we're gonna have an evening where we, we specifically can have a tropical theme and really play on our summer display. And so we're gonna have, you know, keeping with those bromeliads, we're gonna have pineapple flavored drinks <laughs> and, you know, hopefully some, you know, steel, uh, steel drum band music or something like that. And then, actually do a walk in the garden with the curator talking about all of the plants and foliage so well, educational and fun too and, and speaking of in addition to the plants i also noticed some beautiful sculptures that when we were walking through <clears throat> Yeah, that, that's a new thing for us that we haven't done before. It's um, uh, a sculpture exhibit um, by an artist uh, out of Vermont, actually. He's nationally known. He's got some international sculptures, too. Um, but it's all stone. And so it fits in really well with the garden. What I loved um, when he was talking about it was, he's like, this stuff was here before we were. It'll be here after we are. Kids can touch it. Kids can play on it. It's you know, it's hardy stuff. You don't have to, it's not like you have to go it's in. It's not and delicate about, art. Exactly, exactly. So and it really fits our space and our scale nicely. And that's here through the end of August. Okay, so, so we're going with the tropical, a tropical plant theme for your annuals and stuff. What, with the plants comes soil and dirt. Mm -hmm. uh, what is more Oklahoma than our Oklahoma red dirt? What are y'all gonna be doing with that? <laughs> Well, we're doing all kinds of stuff. We're doing a, um, probably the, what, what gets people's attention the most is we, there's an International Mud Day. Um, and we Who celebrate, it, it, <laughs> yeah, there's no card yet, but um, in June, at the end of June, it's International Mud Day. And um, we just thought that we have the space and the ability to um, have some fun with mud and invite kids and families. I mean, you know, it's one of those things that people just kind of go, ah, 
<laughs> but, you know, I did that as a kid. Kids playing in with oh, mud yeah. pies and stuff like that. And it's so important for kids to still have that opportunity mm -hmm. because if they don't have that, then are they ever going to garden? Are they going to get out in nature? So um, we do an, an International Mud Day and build a big kind of mud pit. And last year we had everything from babies to parents in the mud and we spray everybody off and tell them to bring extra clothes and just have a you know some great pictures <laughs> well, what a fantastic time whether you like plants or you want to come see the art or the mud exactly uh, so when can uh, visitors come out and visit the garden so yeah we're open you know six days a week now which is great um, and what we're doing this year that we're going to try something new for us um, is extended hours on Thursdays and so in June July and August we're going to open early at nine o'clock in the morning other days we open at 10 and then on uh, Thursday nights we'll stay open all the way till nine o'clock and you know with those long okay. days that we have that time of the year in the, in the summer months we're going to actually kind of have our music start a little bit later we're going to have food trucks out here and stuff but it's just an absolutely wonderful time to be out here in the garden when the sun's going down it's it's you know we're obviously biased but we think it's pretty magical yeah there's no better time to enjoy the garden in the nice uh, evening dusk well Lori thank you for sharing all these exciting events that are coming this summer yeah Thank you for coming out and I hope y'all come out again and see us soon. We're here at the home of Tom and Nancy Stevens outside of Stillwater, Oklahoma. And Nancy, you're a homeowner that you've got a little bit of a land here and you've decided to quit mowing your front yard. Can you tell us what made you choose that? That's right. We moved here nine years ago and we used to mow all of this. And um, I don't know, a few years ago, um, um, I was out mowing and I started noticing interesting plants. So I'd mow around them. Uh -huh. and, um, and, and then I found out what they were and I liked it. <laughs> and so <laughs> every year I mowed I would uh, just leave interesting plants or that I um, finally just quit mowing all together. Right, and, and so now you have like milkweed and we're finding plantains and... Exactly. It must just be a joy to come out here and see kind of what's new and discover those things. Every, every day I try to take a walk through here and I'm just amazed at, uh, it's just forever changing. Uh -huh. There's always something new blooming or uh, something I find that I don't, I have to try to identify, and it's just, it's just, uh, I've just loved it. So instead of, you know, having to be a chore, you exactly. have to mow it every couple of days, spin that gasoline and that sort of stuff. Now you just take a walk through it and you get to see things like the Indian paintbrush, mm -hmm. um, you know, the goat's beard, which is this neat little daisy-like flower. Mm -hmm. uh, so what have you learned in this whole process? I mean, you've done some plant ID also. Right. I have, uh, I've uh, just learned so much about plants. And at, at one time I didn't know the names of any of these. They were just weeds. Uh -huh. But now, you know, we have the Indian paintbrush. We have the antelope horn milkweed. Uh, there's just, it's just all uh, yarrows out here. You've got and, some rubecchia that's going to be coming right. on later. and Yes. And a lot of colorful, unique grasses as well. Right. And, and in, you know, in, um, in two weeks, this will all be different. There'll be something else blooming. Well, uh, you found one that was really unique last year. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> right. And um, I don't know how many times I had walked by this little plant. But uh, I was out walking with the dog and uh, looked down and there was this little, little plant about this tall and it had spiral white flowers around the top, no leaves. And I, I, uh, I identified it and got some confirmation that it was a, um, a native orchid, wow. a terrestrial orchid that, that lives here. I had no idea we had orchids in the United States. Yeah, and right out here in your front yard <laughs> right. in the prairie. It not wasn't what, in a greenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> not what you think of as an orchid. Exactly. But, but a nice little surprise. Yes. Well, and you've got more across the way. Let's go take a look over there. Okay. So Nancy, just coming across the street, it's amazing how you see different plants over here. Yes. You've got the Mexican hat that's starting to come on. 
And you only have one Indian paintbrush over exactly. here. Exactly. It's here somewhere, but hopefully next year we'll have more. Yeah, and you've got some uh, Rubeckia coming. Mm -hmm. So who ha have you used as a resource to help you identify some of these plants? Well, I have a few books, but um, I'm not trained as a, uh, you know, by botanist at all and so uh, I found a group on Facebook uh, run by the uh, Oklahoma Native Plant Society and I joined that group and I have really learned a lot. I mean I you take a picture of something and post it on their page and you get um, uh, you know several people that can comment and uh, at least give you some ideas of what it is, but most of the time their idea is correct. Oh, well, good. It kind and, of leads uh, you down through your research a little right. bit. Right. And so, do you mow this, or what are you going to do with it eventually throughout the season? How well, do you after, maintain it? After our Mexican hats and the uh, Rudbeckia bloom, I will, um, this, this grass, uh, annual grass will grow, you know, will die, and it'll, everything will start looking ratty. So probably midsummer, uh, August sometime, I will mow, I'll mow all this down, and except for the grasses. And if you look out through here, you can see uh, clumps of grass, blue stem, uh -huh. and there's some, um, oh, I don't know, several different kinds of grasses out here. So you'll let those come And out. I'll let those grow up. And then in the fall, you know, they'll be standing up out here putting on a show and and uh, then we'll have something to look at all winter. Well, mowing it just a couple of times during the season sure beats, right. you know, mowing it every week or a exactly. couple of weeks. Exactly. It saves a lot of mower gas. And just look at all the flowers that you get when you really get out here in the garden. That's right. Well, Nancy, you have a lovely prairie garden out here and thank you for sharing it with us. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. I never get tired of salad and today we're going to do a green salad with raspberries. So I'm going to get started with the dressing. Um, first of all, I'm going to use uh, one and a half tablespoons of olive oil. This is really simple. We're just going to mix them together. Uh, one and a half teaspoons of, I've got red wine vinegar. You can use a different flavor. A small amount of Dijon mustard. Let's see if I can even get it in here. It's uh, about a fourth of a teaspoon. So uh, most of it looks like it's still on the spoon. Then a fourth of a teaspoon of salt and an eighth of a teaspoon of black pepper. Just simply going to whisk those together. It's a small amount of dressing. So if you find you're a person who likes a lot of dressing, uh, you may want to double this recipe because we're going to put this over five cups of greens. So it doesn't take long to whisk together that amount. And put that over the greens. And I'm using uh, mixed spring greens. Uh, you could use spinach, you could use uh, whatever kind of uh, greens that you've got coming off on the garden at that time. Blend those together or toss them together enough that you get uh, the, the greens fairly well coated. Now there's a couple of other ingredients that are going to go in here that some people would add at this point. Uh, my experience with adding those kinds of things is that when I'm tossing they end up at the bottom. So I tend, unless I'm serving this salad at, in mass, uh, but if I'm doing individual servings, uh, then I'll add those to the top of it later. So this is going to make about four servings. So we're going to put some on, on a plate and then we're going to top it with some raspberries. I've got a cup of raspberries here. We'll just kind of make them look pretty on top of it. I like raspberries and other fruits in salads because so many of us think uh, it's a salad, it has to be a tomato, and that's so not true. There, whatever fruit you have in season almost always tastes awesome uh, on fresh salads in the summertime. Got a little bit of blue cheese I'm adding here and a little bit of toasted pecans. And that's all there is to it. Goes together very, very quickly. Looks great. Tastes awesome. What more can you ask from salad? I hope you'll give this a try. It's green salad with raspberries. For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead.
Next week, Casey peels away the mystery behind beard tongues. OSU entomologist Eric Rebeck examines spider mite damage on our boxwoods. Some young friends help us create heavyweight garden markers. And we have tips for storing onions. We hope you join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.